So welcome to the Take a Breather podcast with Stacey Every and Eric Almeida. We are certified emotional freedom technique practitioners. And on this podcast, we discuss how EFT can improve your mental health, mental and physical health by bringing real healing to the body and to the mind. Uh, we also have different types of practitioners visit us on the show to tell us about their methods and how they can facilitate deep healing. As always, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, like, and subscribe on YouTube. That helps the podcast out a ton. And today we'd like to introduce Sunshine Beeson of Inspiral Iridology from Munson, Massachusetts. We're super happy to have you, Sunshine. Thank you. I'm super happy to be here with the two of you. For sure. So who are you and what exactly is Iridology? I am Sunshine Beeson, and I've been in the holistic health field for over 38 years with several different modalities. My foundational piece is Iridology. And actually what that is, is that it's an analysis tool that analyzes the iris, the colored part of your eye, which actually reveals one's physical and emotional health to uncover and unlock the challenges that plague people's lives. So I, I assist in helping my clients in getting to the deep-rooted causes of persistent unresolved inherent imbalances in the body, mind, and soul that all show up in the eyes. So when I heard, so you're my first introduction to iridology. I had never heard of that modality before prior to meeting you. And I remember after us having our first session where you looked at my eyes, I was just baffled by the amount of detail you were able to pull from just looking at that detailed look at my eyes. And it's, how did you how did you get connected with this line of work? It is it still to this day fascinates me the amount of information that is displayed in that in the iris and the colored part. There's actually layers and layers of depth to the iris structure. So many, many, many years ago when I was first involved in my healing arts. Um, I, you know, I, I do nutrition consulting and herbology and uh, box flower essences, a, a plethora of many different modalities. And I was introduced to the infamous Dr. Bernard Jensen, who in the Western world is one of the most well-known iridologists because iridology mm -hmm. actually was discovered back in the 1800s in, in Hungary. Um, and it's, so, it's much more prevalent on the West Coast and in Europe. So I was very, very fortunate to study with this master who is no longer living. And that created this incredible vehicle platform foundationally for my healing work because there's, there was so much information that was all revealed in the iris of all of the other types of modalities that I, that I do. So I could really pinpoint as to what, what this person, each individual really needs personally. That's so cool. So if I'm understanding that correctly, you start with the iridology to kind of get that internal blueprint from your client. And then you have like your toolbox of options as to which avenue to go down with them based on their individual needs. Did I get that correct? Exactly, Eric. Yes. That's so cool. Yes. So in fact, do you re refer out sometimes? Like I assume, since so I also you know seen your work and had my my eye looked at and and I was uh, again flabbergasted with how detailed of you know just uh, like, such minute aspects of the body you could see the you know the fact I'd had a, you know endocrine system problems and the, the, the things I've had going on in my own life you could see. So I assume there's a list of things that that you would potentially say like you have a heart condition you should talk to do you refer out sometimes for for particular um issues or how does that work what happens with, when you look I, at someone's eye yeah yes exactly so if i don't have something in my personal toolbox to assist somebody then i love to collaborate and network with others so, uh, yeah, so I can see um, structurally what's going on with your bones, and I would refer somebody to a chiropractor. Mm. Um, I, I love to network with 
people that do lymphatic massage because, of course, I can see the whole lymph system in the eyes. And so I would refer somebody to get some lymph tissue work. And and I would work with that person on the emotional level because 90% of the time of our physical ailments, there is the emotional link that's uh, hiding down in there, (laughs) in that temple of your home there. (laughs) Yeah, I assume... I assume, would you say no matter what the condition is you that's diagnosed with the iridology, you have you have your own tools to deal with the emotional piece of that illness yeah. or yeah. condition? Yes, which is my hypno core release work. Yeah. Can you tell us more about that? So I'm certified in many different types of hypnotherapy, counseling, uh, somatic and uh, emotional release work and I've created my own system called hypno core release so it's a form of hypnotherapy getting to the core so we can create release in the psyche in the body in the mind in the soul getting down to those deep seated core issues that have been packed away that we don't you know it's uncomfortable at times to deal with I admit when, when I hear the term hypnotherapy, I have a very narrow idea of what that is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, my only, I, I, it's been, you know, there's so many modalities that have been, um, re, you know, stuffed in the corner as being fringe or weird or used on, um, you know, for entertainment purposes to make people bark like dogs on stage and stuff like that. So <laughs> I'd love to hear more about your your vision of hypnotherapy like what what's what's happening what's the what's the healing benefit i'm so glad you asked because there this topic or this subject this modality really needs some clarification Mm. to the to the media and uh to social well-being here so hypnosis stage hypnosis is something that is like a circus act this is not the the path that I travel down. I do the hypnotherapy, which hypnotherapy is is we are naturally, I, I would say, let's say in trance state or hypnosis state uh, every day. When you're driving your car and you are going from point A to point B and you've got other things on your mind, other thought processes, your subconscious part of you is taking you on that journey where you don't have to pay such attention all the time. And hopefully you are because you're driving, but oftentimes you are are daydreaming. You know, if you just kind of space out or you're daydreaming, you're tapping into that unconscious subconscious part of you, which holds all bits of information. That's the blueprint of accurate detail of everything that's happened to you basically in your life that gets filed away like a computer system, like a tracking system of your computer, like in your hard drive. And I don't know much about computers, but I know I can language it that way. So the information is all inside of you. It's all there. And so what most hypnotherapists might do that when, when they're dealing more with, on the, um, with the emotional body is accessing that part of you, but you're cognizant, your mind is aware of everything that's going on. So you're, we're not suggesting anything that, that is uncomfortable or that you're not able to access yourself. So all hypnosis really is self-hypnosis, unless you're doing stage hypnosis. <laughs> which is the circus act. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. No, so I, I can certainly attest to that. So I, I've had, so for open disclosure, I've had one session with you and that was my first time doing anything in the hip, in hypnotherapy or any, I've never done the stage hypnosis ever. I never wanted to. And you're, you're, what you described is dead on right. Like I was, I was always present during the entire process, but it it's, it definitely kind of felt like a almost like, like a, almost like a, a form of like guided daydreaming, where like yeah. I wasn't you know like depending on your guidance, depending on what I was getting in tune with. So either it was either either you were guiding me towards the visualization that you're helping me create in my mind, or you're guiding me towards me connecting with sensations in my body. But there, I was always 
I was always there. Like that, like my conscious, rational mind was always there. It might have been a little bit more on the back, but it was always, like it yeah. was still there. It, it's never like he, right. never, he never went away. So that's right. Right. So basically with the hypno, hypno core release is what, what I'm doing with my clients is we're going through these layers, layers of emotions that are deeply embedded in different organs in the body. And it's kind of like packing a suitcase and putting so many clothes in there and then sticking that in the attic where it just, it just accumulates and accumulates. And sometimes it's so full, it just wants to burst open. Well, that's the emotional body uh, where it gets so full of some of these emotions that either were just too, it, too, in too much fear to address. Um, and then it will cause dis-ease in the body in some way, some form. So when we unpack that, when we unpack that suitcase, it creates more spaciousness and room to experience more joy and freedom and um, come into your own identity and autonomy. You know, it's so many, it's so interesting how there's so many things. So I've, I've been holistic medicine focused myself for only 10 years. And a lot of my assumptions were based on, I guess, uh, well, you know, you, you, how I say this, the things I've been learning about holistic medicine, but then also about things like energy work and um, um, more the woo-woo therapies, Reiki and stuff is that it's separate from the body, right? And it's so funny to think, and just clicking to me now that I don't know if this is everyone's connotation with the spiritual versus the physical, but it sounds like what you're saying is the spiritual is the physical, just like the mind is the body, because if the subconscious if the eyes are recording, so, so the eyes are recording genetic history, right? So yes. stuff that, you know, why would, or, and, and future genetic history as well, correct? Like ge the generations yes. coming are, is also recorded in our eyes. So that's, um, like, that's, yeah. that's well beyond the physical, right? Indeed it is. Uh, but what happens, I think, in, in our world, in our society, people, um, there's a fragmentation, the way that I like to say this, and there's a separation in the four domains, which is physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental. So folks either will go be so inundated with the spiritual aspects of life, they forget about their body and nutrition, mm. or they're so mentally oriented to, to calculate and have that mind constantly going that the spiritual gets lost. So there's a disconnect there. And then, you know, they, they're, they will really get into taking care of their emotions, their emotional body, but then they, they forget about the other parts too, the mental capacity. So, you know, there's, there's lots of disconnects that happen with people, but what I love to do is to take all the parts, all the parts of that one person because we've got a whole household with rooms where there's the younger parts, especially the inner children of all ages that will still live uh, alive and well within us that are the ones that are in reaction rather than response. So what I mean a little more about that is we have our adult self. Now, let's say we have a situation where we're going to be in reaction or get triggered it's really not that adult self that is in that trigger. It's the younger part of self that is disconnected and will um, be in that reaction. So uh, there's a lot of symbolism that I use and metaphors here. <laughs> so, mm. And it sounds like you're saying that some of these parts live in specific organs. Is that what you said? The, the emotions actually can create residue in the specific in different organs mm. it, if if those emotions are not um, met and brought into maturity. Mm -hmm. So I assume that's where the iridology is extremely helpful because you know exactly which organs are under stress from yes. your analysis. Right. And do you assume there's always an emotional component to any dis-ease within the organs? You know, I would say that it's probably it's close to 90%. And that's what has been um, 
understood and uh, uh, analyzed is, is that ne- it's about 90% that there's an emotional component or link to our uh, dis-ease or physical maladies. Mm. So I wanted to share something with you that um, maybe will make a little more sense of things of, of how we carry generationally this, uh, these aspects. So I have uh, twin grandchildren. They're going to be five years old. And when they mm-hmm. were eight months, I took photographs of their eyes. That's my, that's my method, by the way, is I use an iridology camera that really lights up the depth of the fibers in the eyes in the iris. So I took photographs of, of uh, my grandkids, boy, girl, and I told my daughter exactly the personality that my uh, grandson was going to have and saw where there was a link that was un- not cleared with his father, my daughter's husband, of there were some issues between uh, his his mother and himself that never got cleared some anger issues that showed up in my grandson's eyes. Mm -hmm. And okay. So that's, that's one little aspect. And then I also saw that his lymph tissue was very sensitive and that he should not consume gluten or dairy. And um, my daughter's pretty organic and she's very much into all this, but there was occasion where he was having some gluten and dairy and it, he got an infected lymph node. And I, I, cause I told them that this was going to affect his lymph tissue. He had to have surgery at two years old Oh my in, word. in his lymph node. And so, yeah. So anyway, you know, we can see these predispositions for happening and how to take important measures. And I love to take pictures of baby's eyes or, or children, because then we can create a plan, a plan of action, uh, you know, for lifestyle and for nutritional methods to avoid. I tracked uh, a, a young child for five years and expressed what the predispositions were and the parents were able to catch it. And they, Everything that I was saying about about this child's eyes uh, was happening. It was coming true, and so that that I, I just love this. You know mm-hmm. that it's so um, it's so effective. It's such a great tool. So, using that example with your grandchild, so he he inherited something an unresolved emotional emotional mm-hmm. hurdle from his father, right what now now that he is his own entity his own person mm-hmm. what does mm-hmm. so what does the grandchild do with that so it's really interesting because he was having some he didn't know how to deal with some of his emotional outbursts and because my daughter is, is who she is and so conscious she's created a feelings corner to identify what he's feeling and that is really cool because there's faces on there on these little cards and so now he expresses what he's feeling and here's the interesting thing how this energy works because he's able to express himself and be so conscious about it it has now transferred back to his father where his father is communicating better with his mother oh my god (laughs) I didn't realize it goes backwards. It can go three generations back, three generations forward. I call this the ripple effect. So it starts to affect other people, right? Other, other people in your sphere, in your field, in your, in your business, uh, in, in your, all your relations in different ways. So it's pretty powerful stuff. (laughs) It's amazing. Are there, so when it comes to children, as far as the, the treatment, quote unquote, goes, it's mostly, is it information that you give the parents or do you have your own do you have things that you can do with kids as well? You yourself with the modalities that you have at your disposal? Um, I Yeah, I mean, I, I work with um, the kids on different levels. Mostly I work with uh, teens. I had a young 
man, a young man that was 16, and he was ready to commit suicide. Mm. And he had his sexual preference as being with, with boys. And that was not accepted too well in his, with his, in his uh, peer group. So mm. his self-esteem was shot. He was really withdrawn and there was not a level of acceptance in his world. Well, we, we worked some things. Uh, uh, we, of course, we did the HypnoCore release where he was really able to start to have his voice and express. And we did some things that really shifted uh, with his mother because things go way back down into those genes. And, you know, I did give him some other um, flower essences and aromatherapy and some other practices to do. So with all of the different, um, different systems, he, he is loving life. His mother came to me and was in tears and said, Mm -hmm. I, I can't believe the transformation that's happened. He is now like engaging in school. He wouldn't go to school. He was engaged. He started to engage and participated and stepped up into different, um, leadership programs, actually. So um, that's impressive. It was so, it was so cool because he couldn't wait for his sessions. Now he'd been in counseling for years, 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 and he hated it. And he was so excited to come to the sessions. I, I, I just, it was fantastic. So transformations like that, I feel like my, my life is so on purpose when, when people get results like this, it mm. makes me want to cry, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. especially, I mean, it, and how lovely to work with someone young enough that, it, I mean, I know with the habits we can develop based on our traumas and the stuff that's, you know, the, the, the emotions stuck in our, our organs and our tissues, we can just really ingrain some habits in our systems. I assume working with younger people who haven't, I get to see them being fresher, you know, like the, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 the stuff is less ingrained, the habits are less pro- profound, the, the healing could be even more profound more quickly with young people, I assume. It, it can be. And sometimes those things are so cemented core deep. But one of the Mm -hmm. things that happens is that I really see people, right? I see, I see inside, inside their hearts. And um, it's just when there's a, there's platform that I create where I'm really creating the space to see that person. It's, um, it's pretty remarkable because then, you know, they, they feel like, like they're a person and they're not, they're not ignored or, or, you know, had these um, bad experiences where people don't get to see them for who they are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's amazing work. So the hypnosis core release, um, uh, can you, could you do a little sample, just if you're interested, tell um, people listening, like what, what happens, you know, what exactly happens during a, a typical session with you? Well, like I say, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a guided process and I get people into a very relaxed state. We do some breathing techniques, perhaps. It just depends um, each person. Some people can go into relaxation uh, very, very quickly. Some take a little bit more time. And I, I'm using a lot of metaphors and uh, symbols. And then we kind of look at the basis for the very first thing is getting to those levels of the emotions. Where are those emotions? What's rising up in the body? You know, what, what, what are you sensing that's coming up? And everything is welcome. Every single emotion is welcome. And in our world, you know, the, the uncomfortable emotions is we're always trying to suppress them. Mm. So, you know, we're trying to just, I don't want to feel that it's too uncomfortable or, or we've got ways in the world of just think, just think positively. <laughs> well, here's mm. the thing, you know, here's the thing that I, that I look at. Um, there's a, I love the mindfulness movement and I think it's really relative and important, but there's a missing piece at times with that because in mindfulness, I think people can spiritually bypass 
And that means um, people that are really uh, conscious and have had a lot of healing work. The mind can get in there and be very slippery and take them out from feeling the depth of what they need to feel. Because once we are allowing that emotion to really presence itself, it dissipates. It just needs a voice. It just needs to be heard and be witnessed or be seen and not, um, not suppressed <laughs> because that's where, where things start building up. And that's where when people get so frustrated or depressed or angry, like the flip side of anger is passion. Right. So when we mm. keep dishonoring that anger and, and in our society, anger is, is repressed or looked down upon. Well, we don't want to take that anger out on our tribe, on our family. We want to we want to address that anger in a safe way. But we've got it's all energy, right? All emotions are it, are just energy, emotion. Those emotions are supposed to move <laughs> like a river, mm. like a mm. roaring river. Like when you shut a dam off, you know, what's going to happen? It's going to be explosive. And then when you let that dam water just flow out, it becomes a stream, it becomes very calm and neutral, right? So then it's manageable. It's like, what happens when people go through the full course of my hypnocore release? Oftentimes it's like being in the eye of the storm. Okay. So you're grounded and you are solid with your own sovereignty, your own identity, your own feelings. And then everything in that storm is circulating around you, like the world, the politics, the, your, the family, the business, whatever it is that's in this chaotic spin, but you're not hooked into it. You don't get hooked. Now, there's going to be times, of course, where you're going to feel emotions, things are going to rise up, but you have, you have better tools and ways, just like you guys have your tapping, right? We have all of these tools that are effective and help in the conglomeration of healing at its best. So, you know, I think all of the holistic um, tools work to enhance one another. Absolutely. No, for sure. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, thinking about how, you know, well, what you said when we maybe think of the fact that um, the elements of, of the healing process, one of them being so much about acquiring trust yes. for our, to ourselves. I mean, trusting our own body's wisdom, like the fact that you start off the session, assuming the body knows what to work on first that what, right. what's coming up, that, that that's what's important right now. And we're trusting the body's okay. wisdom and, and how much of the healing process is about the person learning to trust their bodies again, or trust their own intuition again, or trust their sensations again. And that getting mm -hmm. sick and that getting in that illness is an opportunity for healing well beyond whatever, uh, particular symptom or condition you've got going on right then because it's that opportunity for you know the, the accessing emotions we haven't accessed before and i i just um uh i just find it frustrating often how culturally speaking there's so many things in place to keep up us from feeling our emotions a and then b how easy the how to the slippery mind you know how easy it is for even if you do engage in the healing process and you get to, it's so easy to get to a certain point you know the danger of knowing a little right i you know yeah. just when you know just enough to be dangerous like oh yeah. I, I i've healed this part of myself and i know yeah. all about, and i know all about that and, <laughs> and now i'm good thanks and i'm gonna uh -huh. try, you know and i'm not gonna go any further underneath the surface because i a feel better and b have just enough trust to navigate the world and see the stuff underneath feels so dark and difficult. And it, as you say, you know, it's once it's, it's in my own experience over and over again, once you witness the emotion, no matter how bad it is, it's, it loses so much of its, um, its power and it's, it's dread. Right. And you, you said a key thing here, Stacey, it, 
I look at life and everything that comes into your field. All right. Anything that's showing up for you is an opportunity. If we can get underneath, right. Mm -hmm. Get underneath to what the lesson is because it's there for a reason. And it's, I I like to reference this oftentimes as if you're going to cut the tops of the weeds off in your garden, you're going to get more weeds because you didn't get to the roots. Mm. So by getting to those roots, you are creating more space in that soil, more space in your emotional body to have the things that you want to have more pleasure, more joy, more freedom, more ecstasy. So it's it, these emotions that we've suppressed with trauma or certain circumstances or different memories that we have, or the younger parts of ourself that are holding on to these situations. It's heavy stuff. It's, it's weight. We, so therefore the fatigue comes in, the tiredness comes in and it's, it's weighted junk that we've packed away. Right. But when Mm -hmm. we get down underneath and pull those weights, you know, and give them some space, give, give it some room in there. Then there's the big opportunities that come in of being a whole person that you came in and and having your purpose, having self-esteem, self-worth start to be restored. What I love about your work that makes, I I know would have made me feel um, immediately more at ease with the process (laughs) is that there's so many pieces that, you know, so I know when I began my healing journey, it was, you know, I'm broken, I'm, I'm a messed up person, I need to, you know, I need to fix myself, quote unquote. And then all, the, and then I learned over time, all the pieces that weren't my fault, you know, this, here's all the things you learn from your birth family. And then now you Absolutely. also have, right. And then you also have all the things, oh, here's the things that came down in your genetic history <laughs> that you, yeah. re- you really had nothing to do with and that, and to be able to go after the, look at those things and say, oh, I have this predilection, not because of anything that's quote unquote wrong with me. It's a, it's a burden I carry from my ancestors and how freeing it is to know, to recognize that as some of the things that we struggle with aren't, aren't our fault. Exactly. So I, I, I want to say something about, about that in there that, you know, about the, the human heart and feeling like people are broken I, I've dedicated myself for all these years to assist in being a healer of the human heart through the emotional body because they're, the emotions are here to guide and teach us. So I, I heard a saying once, I don't, from a healer, I don't fix what's broken. I heal what's torn mm. so that we can, we can remend. And I've adopted that kind of philosophy because we're not broken. Nobody's broken. Mm-hmm. It's just we've had pieces of ourselves that have been separated or torn. And so we're mending back together. We're recalibrating, right? It's such a, a, a beautiful paradigm compared to, I mean, it's just, a, it's the paradigm to replace our, our vision of what, what health means, what, you know, what we are as humans and our biology, our emotional hearts to see us as that way fundamentally. Yeah. They would shift everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of things um, you're talking about as far as um, you know, the eye of the storm and all the different things that can be swirling around us. When, when you or I were speaking um, not too long ago, uh, another aspect that people often struggle with is, um, you know, so there's the, there's the, the past, you know, the, the genetic history, there's the stuff we learn as children. And then there's uh, a cu- the current world we live in and the, low level or high level or medium level of stress most people have all the time. And you were saying that people can actually become addicted to stress. Yes. The, the way we're yes. addicted this to is, anything. And I'd like, love to hear more about that. This is a really um, interesting thing, what happens, because this is part of our primitive brain or amygdala. So biologically, once the stress, the stress response is activated, then our body starts pumping hormones and, and there's stress hormones like cortisol or adrenaline and also dopamine. So dopamine gets mixed in there, which is, is kind of like a high. Okay. So normally 
our our adrenals, our adrenal glands are meant for fight or flight, like if a tiger, right? The old thing, if we're cavemen and uh, a natural or a natural disaster or a natural thing of an enemy comes up and we're going to go into this, this feeling. Once the threat has passed, our body starts to go back to normal into a functioning cadence. But here's what happens when we are in, let's say, you know, financial trouble or we have excessive workloads or relationship difficulty and we keep in these perpetual patterns, these, these patterns, I call them, or the imprinted patterns, that's where we get into trouble where it starts to turn into like an addiction because this, the stress response becomes so habitual that you start seeking unconsciously, mind you, unconsciously more stress. And you start, you know, either you're overworking or your, your mind keeps going at a perpetual race, like a spinning the wheel all the time. And you start to be, get, become addicted to these heightened states because the adrenaline keeps pumping. So it's just like a drug. And really what happens then we start to do things, you know, that are going to try to alleviate it. Like we go into what I call escapism. So it's either going to be with alcohol or, or watching excessive movies or wanting to avoid. Underneath that is where we have the disconnect with ourselves. But I also call it a spiritual disconnect where we sort of, and this is not about religion. Okay. This is, um, where we pinch off our spiritual cord of the divine and we feel like we're all alone and we have to do everything ourselves. And then the stressors start happening because now we've let our guard down. We have leaks, tears and holes in our energetic field. Okay. Our auric field. We have seven layers of this. And we are bombarded by the stressors of society. Uh, I mean, the whole pandemic thing has created a parasympathetic nervous system um, problem. Okay. So sympathetic part of ourselves are the, um, excuse me. Yeah. So it's attacked the parasympathetic. That's our, our, um, ease and, and digest and relax. The sympathetic right now in our whole society is on overload, is on overstress because we've, we're, it's permeated. So we have to have these tools to take care of ourselves every day. Like, you know, the American Express card, don't leave home without it. Well, I, it's important to ground yourself, to protect your energetic field by you know, meditation is helpful. Breathing's helpful, but coming back to self. And we've, when we've got so many distractions, we keep leaking. We leak out. And then, <laughs> you know, we're not even ourselves anymore because everybody else's energy is all over us. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Does that make sense? Oh, it, yeah. Absolutely. I, mm -hmm. As, as an, as I'm, a naturally empathic person, I can totally understand that. Like where you're yeah. just covered in other people's emotions and mm -hmm. you are just lost. You don't, you don't know what's going on. You don't like you're, you're, you're feeling things and then you're, you're getting lost. Exactly. Between, is this, is, is this mine or is this someone else's? Yeah. yeah. You know, I work with a lot of healers because healers really, and empaths because they, they kind of get the brunt of it and un, being, you know, people say they're grounded or they're doing protection and they're doing certain things, but being as sensitive humans as empaths and healers may be, they're still getting a wash all over themselves and they're not, they're not really aware of it. And, and we've got to really, it's like brushing your teeth every day. You have got to clean and clear and cleanse that part of yourself. So I teach my clients about all those things. What are some of your recommendations from coming off the addiction? Because I'm, I didn't know, my goodness, the, it, I don't know why it didn't occur to me, but it makes perfect sense since every other 
we have so many addictions like we're um you know the the sugar addiction is an insulin addiction yeah. right yeah. and because the, the same thing we, we get the insulin hit to us we get addicted to the insulin hit to our system so i i didn't know about the dopamine i i you know i didn't know that was one of the I know because dopamine is one of the things I'm trying to create as a massage therapist. <laughs> yes, yeah, Try, exactly. Trying to make it, we want dopamine to happen. The fact that it's wrapped into the stress response, it's like, oh, well, mm -hmm. that doesn't sound good. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, clearly, it's 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 what the human the human system thinks is best in order to handle survival, right? It's all about survival, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is. Yeah, so, and so, it, it, yes. Yeah. So, what do you think of the? what do you, what, what kind of tactics or thought processes do you have for people who are like, Oh, I am, I am addicted to stress, or I would just, uh, or maybe I'm addicted to stress and I want to try not to be, you know, what, what are some, some suggestions you have? So basically it's again, with, with most all of this, it's getting to, it's getting underneath. What is the driving force that has you, uh, uh, avert or divert to going to the to that habit or that mm. pattern right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. when we can get underneath these imprints get underneath what is at the core of this we unravel it so we're not we, because people that are so stressed like that they're t they're like wrapped around with coil okay there's mm. it's so so tightly wound up and wrapped up but when we get things to loosen up and unravel, then there you can, it's like you're seeing for the first time, right? You, you start to see things clearer and then you're not hooked as easily. And if you do some of the practices that, you know, I, I do teach my clients and um, to do that when we're working on the, the energetic parts, um, it's having understanding and clarity, you know, having awareness. The first, and I know that two of you know this, but the very first thing that needs to happen for anybody to shift or change is we have to have awareness and we have to have a hunger that is so big to want to change because otherwise, you, you, you know, as you both know, in the healing professions that you're in, if somebody doesn't want to, it's not, there's no shift going to happen. So I would go to, I oftentimes do these expos and health fairs. I've done them for many, many years. So I'll, I'll do an example, you know, I'll give little mini iridology sessions for people and I'll have a woman, let's say, um, and they, they'll be so excited about it. They're going, I have to have my husband do this. I said, uh, nope, not unless he gives permission to me and that he steps forward and says he wants to, because there, there will be such resistance, right? The, I mean, it doesn't work. You have to want to. <laughs> so that's yes. the first thing. got to want to. <laughs> yeah. Since in fact, all the modalities we've been talking about in, involves absolute buy-in by the individual themselves yeah. and that's, that's that's how they work is because we're, we're collaborate we collaborate with them we don't you know send send the information from on high and and you know smack them on, on the head and say you're healed so yeah you really do need the the person yeah. has to be the engagement has to be there absolutely that makes total sense I mean, it's kind of funny because when I, uh, you know, I've been doing this for over 38 years. So back when I was first learning iridology, we had to study hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, literally hundreds of eyes. And I mean, I was dreaming about irises, but <laughs> it was so exciting to me that every person I would see or mate, I, I mean, I was so, I was wanting to read their eyes. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to just give them the information and I started to just you know really without permission I I would start to say hey you know this is what's going on with you and I I'd suggest that you do this and then I was so overzealous about it, it was like oh my god shine your waist overstepping boundaries here people have to come to you and there has to be an invitation they they have to want to do this so <laughs> mm -hmm. I um I had to to uh her down a little bit about it with my excitement. <laughs> you know, I, I, I hear, I, I totally hear what you're saying because it's, 
when you're honing that a skill like that, you know, whether it's iridology or some other form of healing modality, and then you, you, you create that sixth sense where you can start to see past the surface layer and be like, you know, there's this or that, like, like I, I would, it wouldn't surprise me, Stacy, with you being a massage therapist for many years that you can see people walking by being like, oof, like you really should work on your hip because you're walking <laughs> weird or, or like you've yeah. got so much tension in yeah. your neck because you're locked up and stuff like that. And yeah, it's, you have that, that sense. And then all of a sudden you see all these, that you see all these different things everywhere. And you just want to start being like, Hey, like you can get yeah. better. And this is where you should work mm-hmm. on. And the person's like, who the hell are you? What are you doing? Right. It's, it's one exactly. of the spiritual practices of being a good practitioner is getting over your fixer, the, the fixer mm. in you oh, yeah. who wants to go. Yeah. In, mm-hmm. yeah. A wants to, you know, um, as you say, you know, sunshine uh, kind of skip over their boundary and then also mm-hmm. be, the, be and then also be the one to swoop in and and make it all better as well. Like that's that's a whole. I know it's a, a piece. I know a it's lot a of whole, pictures. It's a, yeah. it's a whole thing we have to go through to be to be um, uh, ethical and uh, yeah. and 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 more of, and it's effective too, practitioners because it's the person's mm-hmm. body that, that knows best always. Well, what I realized is, is I have a part, you know, long ago I had a, I had a fixer part. I wanted to fix until I had heard that beautiful saying, I don't fix what's broken. I heal what's torn. Mm-hmm. And then I, I really stepped back, you know, in a, in a much more humble and gracious way to allow, right. Allowing, allowing is the, is the feminine. I, I, I work a lot with the masculine and feminine energies that are within all of us, but you know, so what was happening previously is my masculine energy was way in the forefront, wanting to take action, <laughs> wanting to, to fix it, wanting to give the solutions, right? So that's the masculine energy. Yeah. And it's, it's reflected in so many of our systems. I mean, I, I was a high school English teacher for years and, um, you know, when school is mandatory, <laughs> it, it affects the energy of the exchange automatically mm. in a way that is detrimental to the student who is no longer needing, no permission is being asked to engage. Right. right. Yeah. And, and and so and you know p- teachers get frustrated but bottom line they haven't asked permission to the of the students mm-hmm. to do and no one expect and no one thinks to ask permission of the students because it's it's just how it is you have to go to school and that's and that's that and you have to pass the t- and it's all you know punishment based threat based if you don't do this you'll fail if you don't do this you'll grad won't graduate and it's really you know more about uh well it's not about learning so um mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then Western medicine has had that problem too, I think as well with, yeah. you know, this is what I, this is a treatment I am going to do to you because mm-hmm. I'm the, I'm the expert and, and, um, and I, I know more about your body than you do. And those, again, the, the flipping all the paradigms on their heads is just going to be better for everybody. Well, <laughs> let's just go, let's just you know, do that now. I love that perspective of what you just brought up about the school. That is so interesting. Mm. The thing is, is that we are so symptom based. Right. We, yes. we, as a society, we, it's like fix the symptom. I don't want to feel this anymore. Give mm. me a pill, give me a drug, you know? So because we've been, the society has been that for many, many years when patriarchal uh, society took over from the matriarch, from the healers of way back long, long ago, it, it's changed the world. But I think there's there's the reverse happening right now, and people are becoming much more independent and empowered to have their voice and make the choices. So, I think so too. Absolutely, mm-hmm. it's because it, it's. I mean, and it makes sense. I mean, it, you know, the the body. It, it's everything. The microcosm is the macrocosm, right? Our bodies are always seeking balance. Are always seeking homeostasis. Yes. Yeah. In a world where masculine tendencies are used more and um just uh, engaged in more than the feminine eventually the the things have to the balance has it, the world is seeking balance 
It is. And, and we, we have to have both, right? We, we yes. have to have the masculine and the feminine and understand the distinctions between what, what I call the divine or the sacred and the shadow. Mm. So lots, to, lots of awareness about that <laughs> to, to learn and discover. Yeah, again, with the macrocosm and the microcosm, like just what you were saying about, um, you know, the iridology is the, you know, the window into, you know, the, the, what's been torn and the, you have to look at it in order to heal it. And it's true yeah. of the, in our internal shadows or our internal, um, you know, predilections or ones on the outside. Right. Mm. Exactly. Mm. So how would you define the shadow? Because the, the concept of shadow work is, is, is it's it's a it's been talked about mm -hmm. a lot. I'm just curious mm -hmm. where does it where does that stand for you? Because it doesn't it doesn't seem to have a necessarily a universal definition. Right, it doesn't. So some of those distinctions, I I'll, I'll talk about the masculine first, okay, and then you'll get a bit better understanding about this. So some of the shadow masculine qualities would be overpowering, bullying, aggression. Uh, control those are you know it's it's those that kind of flavor in in the shadow masculine I mean there's several several other aspects about it the shadow feminine is um, more about it would be gossiping or putting other people down not knowing what your worth is Self-esteem, self-worth is a is actually a shadow feminine trait. Hmm. It's seduction. It's seducing, manipulating, manipulation, seducing. Those are shadow feminine traits. Interesting. Huh. Mm -hmm. And it's not gender specific. Okay, so we have it in men and women. We come. We're born with this. Now, some people um, are or in the forefront more with their masculine energy. Okay. Like I notice, cause I'm a West coast girl. I noticed when I came to the East coast five years ago, um, the women entrepreneurial women on the East coast, they are really running with their masculine energy. And mm. then they wonder why they are attracting partners that don't cherish them or honor them okay whether they're whether they're into women or whether they're into men because when you are overly in your masculine and if you're overly in some of the shadow masculine you undermine the balance there's polarity here we have to have polarity in order to have the, the yin and the yang or yin and yang so we um, deflect on the, the feminine doesn't have a chance to show up, okay? So the same where, um, or if, if let's say, let's example, give a female woman who is very powerful in her business and she's a business entrepreneur and she would like to have a, a mate, a partner that that's the, that really sees her that really can connect with her heart, but she's not going to get a male partner that's standing in his masculine energy because they're canceling each other out. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So, 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 okay. So she, so in that example, the woman is, so leaning on the scales of masculinity that the only yeah. the only energy that can come in for her would be feminine energy which would not work because she's looking for a male mate that's well she's or, looking that for, be... uh, yeah she's looking for a male mate that um is able to be loyal Lo okay so here's the divine or sacred uh, in the masculine loyal committed um, can take a stand that can allow her to fully be who she is that um, can protect. Um, these are some of the qualities. So instead what she's going to get is a man that's really wimpy or can't, 
take action or can't produce or cannot make money. Okay. So that's, that's kind of, and maybe does that better explain it? <laughs> no, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's same if, if, even if it's, if it's, you know, two people, two men or two women, the same qualities are going to apply. Understanding the, which is, you know, the, the sacred or the divine aspects as opposed to the shadow. So, yeah, creates these really different dynamics. I, I work with couples a lot and um, do couples counseling. And so we bring up a lot of these aspects and bring awareness to this so they can catch themselves. Okay, who's showing up here? Well, okay, what part of me, first of all, is showing up? And is this my shadow part or is this my divine part? What, what's my, what am I contributing in here? Hmm. So it's, it's just really cool stuff to under, have this understanding because then it creates more um, balance and flow in the relationship, hmm. trust and communication. So it's again, what you were saying before about needing to have awareness being key to so much of this and, yes. and also what you said earlier about how, um, uh, when you want to change the world around you, you change yourself, right? How, how your own internal yeah. changes, you know, affect all the, yeah. the people you're connected to and including your, who you attract from the outside as, as a friend or as a, a romantic partner, right? Once you're, yeah. have your own balance, so, uh, your balance sheet in, in a better, yeah. in better state. Exactly. Mm. Um, sometimes it's difficult to understand this ripple effect. I, uh, I, can I give you an example? Mm, please go ahead. Okay. So I love this. I love this part. Um, I have this really wonderful Guatemalan man come to me for a skin problem. And of course I know that there's underneath stuff about that, but we, we looked at everything, you know, I'm going to suggest things for him nutritionally as to what's happening with the skin. But then we discovered of seeing in his eyes that there was issues that he had with his father. And I didn't know he had issues with his father. His eyes told me that. And he said, you know, we all live, we live. It, it's like a, a three story or so complex where he, him and his family and his young children live at the bottom. His sister lived in the middle and his father actually lived at the very top level. He hadn't spoken to his father in four years. And he was so distraught about it. He, and they, they didn't communicate. And he wasn't participating with his grandkids. And so we did some of the hypnocore release work. And after a few sessions, he called me in tears. And I got very concerned. I, I, I said, what, what's happening? What's wrong? He said, oh, my gosh, nothing's wrong. I don't know how this happened. But my father came downstairs. He knew nothing of what we were doing, Sunshine. He came downstairs, knocked on the door and apologized and asked to be with the family again and to see his grandchildren and to have dinner. And he said that was remarkable. So that's part of this ripple thing. <laughs> Where that's amazing. People start to, I know. Okay. I cried when he told me that. <laughs> okay. Oh my God. Of course. That's a, oh, how brilliant. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Oh my gosh. And so then and he had I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Continue, continue. So he then therefore had his whole family. His father didn't come to see me, but his wife, his sister, a cousin, he had his family all come see me because he was so blown away. Of course, his skin issue cleared up mm. <laughs> and, you know, the, the family was together. I mean, it was, oh God, it was so amazing. Oh my goodness. Oh, and what a beautiful a message of hope, you know, when mm. you feel, when, yes. you, when you feel helpless in the world and that everyone around you is, you know, is, is, is in dire straits or they're, or it's, they're, everyone's mean or angry or whatever. And knowing that you can just heal yourself and, yeah. it, and make the world a better place. Like you're lit literally, yes. making the, and it's not just because you're and not just because you're better, but because you're helping people heal all around you. Oh, yeah. So beautiful. 
Yeah. So people say, you know, it's we're in a helpless state. We, you know, the world's fucked up. Excuse me, but um, mm, it's messed fine. up. And um, you know, but the thing is, you have purpose. Everybody has a divine innocence in them, and this is what I love so much because I can see it in everybody's eyes. And you, every single person can make one difference. One difference. And when you do that, you're a beneficial presence on the planet. <laughs> so when you step into your own healing, that's what happens. No, it, it's, it's true. And it's, it's so, that message is so important about the strength of the individual, the strength of the strength of making changes in the microcosm and how it, like you said, it ripples out into the macro and yeah. that it affects those around you. And it, it's, it's so unfortunate because the, the, the narrative in the mainstream at the moment is the reverse that mm. the macrocosm is the cause of, of all ailments and there's nothing you can do besides try to change <laughs> the macro. And it, it's, and the unfortunate thing is like, no, like it, you gotta, like you say, you have to do it in reverse yeah. and you start where you are. And it's, it's, it's so funny. Cause like some, some movements do that. And then some movements don't. So like, I remember this happened earlier in the pandemic. I forget what they called it. There was this huge movement. I'm, I'm curious if either one of you remember of like, of picking up litter. There was this, there was like a hashtag went out and there was a whole big craze about like picking up litter because it was the early days of the pandemic. Everyone was locked up anyway. And people who were going for walks tried and they just noticed, the, you know, nature was covered in crap. And so like this movement started of people just taking charge and cleaning up their little world. And instead mm -hmm. of them saying, you know, my street is dirty. Why isn't the town or the city or the state or the federal government doing something to fix it individuals just was like you know what i'm here this is affecting me let me just do it and they would clean up their own little area their you know their block or their street or their stream or their park and then they would throw they would throw a picture online of like how many garbage bags worth of garbage they picked up and it just caused this ripple of once again this ripple effect mm. of like oh and that's the mm -hmm. thing they they took they they took charge of their immediate environment to, and made yeah. it better for them. And as a result, it made it better for everyone else that was affected by that environment. And just yeah. like what you've been talking about by going into yourself and mending those, those ripped parts of yourself that sends mm -hmm. that ripple effect out to the people in your immediate sphere as well. And we, we, we get so blind to how much power we really do have on an individual level. Yeah, Eric. And just right. that importance of you got to start with you mm -hmm. and then you keep going out. You start with you and that affects your family and that affects your community and that affects your state and that affects your country and then the world and eventually. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard to kind of get people to reawaken to that concept again. Well, that is the hope and the opportunity of, of things like the pandemic, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's those, the, the healing crisis, right? The, it's the, mm -hmm. the, the, mo the moment of truth of, oh, things are so bad. I have to, now I'm gonna, I have to do something. And it doesn't have to be a global problem. It's, it happens to the individual mm -hmm. too, where this is, it's mm -hmm. the moment where we say, oh, I have to do something. And that doing something is what moves us forward in the healing journey and sends out the ripples we're talking about. So exactly. And, you know, I mean, there's so, there's so many gifts and there's a lot of tragedy you know, that's happened along with this. But early on, what I would say to people is, if you can't go out, go in. Mm -hmm. And that was my motto for the, for, for almost the whole pandemic. And it, it, I noticed that there's been a lot of people, 
because we 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 all we want that. I mean, I miss social girl, I miss touch hug queen. I, <laughs> you know, I miss that tremendously. But it, it, what I notice is that it, it really gave people an opportunity to not be overstimulated mm-hmm. in regular 3D, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it, it provided a space and an opportunity for people to really look inside or do some things or, you know, re-educate or get into meditation or be with your family, be with your children, be creative. So there's, there's so many things when we sometimes take away so much of that stimulation, (laughs) we could, so, you know, what are the gifts in here? What is in the field? That's what I always say. What's in your field? What's right in front of you? Maybe it's nothing. Maybe there's no opportunities to to look at anything because we're there's this thing that says we you know we have to stay inside or we're right. But what can we do with it? Right? We have a choice. We have to realize we have choice in each and every moment. And the mind, our puppy mind, has to be trained <laughs> to have that concept. <laughs> I love the term puppy mind way better than monkey mind, which is what people yeah. usually say. I love yeah. that. <laughs> it's so much sweeter. Well, you think, yeah, you think about kinder. that puppy. It, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's, it's excited about life. It wants this, it wants that. The mind wants stimulation all the time. And it, 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 we have a production of what? Thousands and thousands of thoughts per minute. Some of those are not very kind. And those can put us on that trajectory of, you know, of that puppy spinning around, spinning around and getting into trouble, chewing stuff up. We have to train it. We have to know that we are in control of it. Our mature master wise part of ourselves, right? Yes. So, so we've got to become friends with all parts of our being. No, very, very true. Yeah, it's very true. Yes. That's a lovely way to wrap up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of all the ways we can nourish and, and be happy yeah. with our pup with our puppy mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Sunshine, how can people connect with you? Okay, so my website is what is iridology.com. And iridology is spelled I R I D. O L O G Y. And um, I would also love to offer for anybody that's interested in this kind of work, I would love to offer a, um, a 15 minute inquiry, or uh, I can offer a, a little free mini 15 minute session. Um, so you would just register yourself as um, in, in spiral iridology dot a s dot me <laughs> slash or yeah that slash thing inquiry 15 min so that's how to how to get on my uh, um, calendar and then one more thing i would like to just um say too if you're interested in the masculine feminine Um, program, I have an ongoing, consistently ongoing five module webinar that you can do at any time. And and to look up the information for that, it would be bit.ly and then that forward slash masculine feminine course. And there's um, information about that. Wonderful. And we'll put links to all of that into the show notes. So people who are interested can certainly connect with you in that way. And Great. any, any last words of wisdom before we let you go? Uh, just to, you know, it, accept, I, I think Stacy even said this earlier, really to have acceptance, allowing and compassion for yourself for wherever you're at in the present moment. No, super, super accurate, much harder to do in practice. (laughs) (laughs) It is our practice. And it's a, yes, I love that Mm -hmm. thought. A great way to end. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being with us, Sunshine. This is such a pleasure. Thank you, the two of you. you. Thank you so much. Of course. 
And thank you listeners and viewers. We're super happy that you joined us this week and we look forward to connecting with you all again next time.